family. Welcome to BH Millennium Church. Great to have you here. If it's your first time, you are welcome. If it's your thousandth and first time, you're just as welcome. It's great to have you here. But you know, it's not about me making you welcome this morning. It's about God making you welcome. And this morning, I was I was reading through uh, this account of Jesus when he's in the boat, and there's this massive storm comes up. Now, Jesus is with a group of guys who are experienced fishermen. And this account of this story is in three of the Gospels, three, three different books of the Bible carrying the same story. But I love this version, uh, or this uh, rendering, telling of this story in the book of Mark, because this was more than likely written by Peter, recorded by Mark. And Peter was an experienced fisherman. He knew what he was doing out on the water. And so he knew if he was afraid of being on the water, there was good reason. And he says this, this is Mark chapter 4. That day when evening came. <laughs> that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. I remember once, I'm not a great fan of boats. I remember going across the Bay of Biscay on a ferry and laying in my cabin praying. It was one of the most terrifying moments of my life. I was ill, and I was face down on my block, literally gripping hold of it and praying. And so I kind of understand where these guys are at. And Jesus was in the stern, and he was in the back of the boat, he was sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves, and he said, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down immediately. Jesus spoke to nature and it obeyed. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Have you no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Today, there might be wind and waves in your life. There might be a furious school. Maybe your boat is rocking, so to speak. Your boat, your life is rocking. You might be so used to being in it that you're wondering what, what all the fuss is about but all of a sudden things are back and forth and there's wind and there's waves in your life and it's different but Jesus said peace be still quiet be still and I really believe that Jesus can say that to any of our lives today quiet just peace be still See, Jesus is Lord over the storm. We're going to worship him this morning. Thanks.
Lord, not out of uh, a sense of fear in as much as you're going to strike us down if we don't, but Lord, because of our awesome love and respect and honor for you. Thank you, Jesus. Just take your seats for a, a moment, would you? Um, I'm going to ask Sam and Amanda to come and share some testimony, or is it just Amanda? Is it just Amanda or is it both of you? Come on, meet my turn. <laughs> Tell us what's happened this week with the recovery ministry and the training and everything. Sorry. Just come, just come in front then. There you go. Joseph's going to give you another microphone. Well done, son. My favourite thing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we've been really blessed with the ministry this week. Um, so our prayer team um, was praying for us to get some more volunteers. And we've been blessed with the volunteers that have stepped forward and that are getting involved with the ministry. But um, something we didn't foresee was um, one of the local drug and alcohol services providers um, they've got a training um, program going over there and they want to remain anonymous but they, someone from there is going to come and train our volunteers for free, professionally. So, um, you know, so we are, you know, they're not exactly in our actual local vicinity right, right on our doorstep but they want to get involved in what we're doing here in the ministry. So I just think that's amazing, and I'm you know, really blessed to have that offer. And I'm um, going <laughs> to Well done. Yeah, good morning. Um, so yeah, like the man said, you know, we've got a training fighter coming to pray, uh, train the volunteers for the ministry. Uh, and uh, we had our first team meeting this week. It was absolutely amazing. It was such a great time, really powerful morning. We all prayed into the ministry. We've also, uh, we've got a little prayer book that the guys in their own words have been writing in, uh, just with their initials and the prayer team have been you know, we've been emailing that out to the amazing prayer team that we have and they've been praying and we've been seeing real movement in people's lives. Um, you know, it's just been absolutely phenomenal. And uh, it was actually lovely yesterday. We were reading Acts in the Bible study and I'm, you know, when Mark says about testimony, I want to come up and share it every week. I won't. Um, but just yesterday, you know, we had people from the wider church who came and joined us and it was an absolutely amazing time. We were reading um, with, with Peter and the beggar, you know, when the guy's expecting money and he, he says to him about gold and silver I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. Get up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's amazing, that's what we're kind of called to do. So it was just a beautiful time yesterday. We had some poetry from uh, Malcolm Archer, came along and read some of his testimony in the form of uh, poetry, and the guys were just absolutely in awe of that. It was absolutely amazing, blew us all away. Um, and it's just, you know, so many things are happening. I mean, um, tomorrow evening we start Alpha, um, so we'll be running that again. And, you know, we've had a lot of interest to the point where um, we may have to turn people away because people want to come and hear about Jesus, you know, through the course, a course that me and Amanda, myself and Mark, um, thoroughly believe in. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, but we will keep you posted on what's happening in the recovery ministry. And we have, I think we have one spot left for Alpha, so if anyone in the wider church would come, like to come and you know do the alpha course uh, and meet the guys that are in the recovery ministry please talk to me after thank you very much it's so incredible you know i was talking with another minister uh, this week from a, a, another local elin church and he was saying to me oh you know how, how are things we haven't spoken to each other for a number of months and um, he contacted me just just to, to check in, see how it was going, see how we were, which, which was lovely. And they said, how's church? And, and I just start spilling one thing after another. This is happening, and that's happening, and the other's happening, and it's great, people are being saved. And, and, and I said, how are you? And he said, oh, we're okay, we, you know, we're, we're struggling a little bit, and, 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 and that's fine, it's not a problem to do that. And I said to him, do you know what, I, I feel like I'm boasting in, in Know, all these great accomplishments, but it, it's not me at all, not by a long chalk. All I've done is, is said, yeah, come on, let's, you know, I want to encourage people to do the things that they're doing, and that, that's very much where my heart is, is to, to enable other people in their ministries, and that's certainly how I was raised in, in uh, ministry, was being, by being enabled to do and it is so incredible. And we, we just had a wonderful time of prayer together 
and supporting each other. But I am so incredibly blessed by what God is doing uh, through people within the within the, the sort of um, confines of this building and outside. It's it's absolutely wonderful. We need to pray for these guys. I know we are praying for them, and, and um, it's great that we do that. Just just ramp that up a little bit, and, and let's keep keep on the ball with our prayers for that. So vital that we do that. Is there anybody else who would like to share any testimony? Joseph. Oh, did you have your hand up, Ray? No. Jo sorry, Ray. I scared you then, didn't I, Ray? I, Joy put her hand up, and I thought it was Ray. <laughs> right, Joy, you come first, and then Joseph, you come after. We just wipe the mic now. Teenager. I was just having Isaac this morning 
how I once bumped off school for three months on the trot and just took in a letter saying I had a cold at the end and nobody batted an eyelid. And um, that, that, that's not a boast. That's, <laughs> that, that was what my life was like when I was a teenager. I wasn't encouraging Isaac to do the same thing. <laughs> can't do it these days anyway because they phone up as soon as you're not at school, but um, never would have thought that I would be here. And I owe everything to God, I owe everything to a praying grandmother, so keep praying for those in your family. Joseph, this is the first time. It doesn't know what to do without his guitar. <laughs> Sorry if I started, I had to go on this one. I just felt God saying something to me. So um, earlier on this week I had, a, I had a fun little... We're in the same family. Um, I had a fun little thing, funny little thing happened to me this week. Um, so I had a meeting with the recovery group on Thursday night and uh, I, was, I told Sam that I'd be there at 7 or something like that and I was running really, really late and uh, I was rushing, I was rushing like crazy and then I, I ran out of the house to go down to my bike um, just tell them what I said to you first. The last thing my dad said to me was, don't rush. Um, <laughs> so of course I rushed and I ran out of the house and uh, I we have a stairs that leads up to our pathway and uh, I fell down the stairs from the top stair and uh, land, landed on my ankle and uh, really badly hurt it. I really struggled to walk off that and um, I just feel like there's a story behind this because just a bit after that I remembered something so very, very small um, that somebody said to me a few weeks ago, which was uh, the words, two words, be still. Um, and I think often we can get caught up in, um, in the moment of everything. We can, our heads can be rushing like crazy and we can be so, I don't know, I don't know what the word is, busy. But I think some of us need, just need to hear the words, be still. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just give me a second. <laughs> we have a um, very special birthday today. It's not often we, uh, you know, we don't stand up and sing happy birthday every week. Um, because if we do, we'd, we'd be doing it every week and, and it would kind of lose its uh, focus. But we have a very special birthday this week uh, because we have a young man here. Um, he's, he's just out of the youth group. And uh, Al Marcher, I believe, is... I'm not going to tell everybody how old you are tomorrow, Malcolm. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to you to decide whether you want to do that. Uh, but Malcolm has, um, Malcolm has uh, brought in... Uh, some cakes, individually wrapped cakes for everybody, and they're all on the table by the by the back door. So you're welcome to go and pick one of those up on your way out. And we're going to pray for Malcolm. We're going to wish him a happy birthday. Would you like to say anything, Malcolm? Thank you. I'm, yes, I'm one of the younger members of the church, and uh, <laughs> it's it's just a joy, isn't it? We have to share with others the things that happen in our lives and especially as Christians because you know we are brothers and sisters together and uh, I come from a church when before I came here where we used to have our cake and, and uh, coffee and tea and biscuits etc and if there was a birthday a birthday cake was made and it was sliced up and everybody had a slice you know but we can't do that now at the moment anyway. And so I thought, why not? Let's have something that's wrapped up. So these are all wrapped. They've all been laid out, and you just help yourself to one as you go out the door tonight, today, through the hall door. Thank you. That's you all. Bless you, Malcolm. Let's pray for God. Let's pray for God. Let's pray for God. We thank you for Malcolm. Lord, we thank you for his years. We thank you for his experience. We thank you, God, for the uh, vigor that you have put into his life, Lord. We thank you that he is uh, so on fire for you and is so willing to share your word with other people. Lord God, today we just pray your blessing upon him, Lord, to give him 
uh, Lord, to just give him an incredible quality of life. We pray your blessing over him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Malcolm. Bless you. We're going to um, come, obviously, that, that, that uh, testimony time was, uh, sometimes I'm just saying, who wants to share a testimony? And there's nothing, and we move straight on. Um, but of course, would you stand with me? We're going we're gonna to share communion in a moment. We've got no, it's the bank holiday weekend, and we wanted to give people a break from the Zoom, so we've got no online communion tonight. But I wanted to share communion with you this morning. If you've never seen these little uh, packages before, it's just a little um, cup with a, you peel the top off, there's a wafer in there, and there's some juice underneath so that we can share communion together. I'm going to ask um, Jesse and Lizzie if you would come and uh, just distribute those as we sing. And then we'll come to a place of communion together. We're going to share in what God has for us. It's such an honor to be able to do that. Let's sing this song as, as Jesse and Lizzie. Just, if you just hand those out, let people take them themselves. They haven't touched, they're all, they're all clean and secure. If you just take one out, and um, if, if Trevor or Beth, if you could help um, Linda with the, the lid of that, thank you. And um, just take one and hold on to it, and we'll share communion as we finish this song. Doesn't matter whether you've walked away from God and come back to. Doesn't matter 
where you're at in your relationship with him because today is the day for you to put that right, for you to come into his presence and say, God, I just give my life to you again. And I'm going to pray that prayer. God, I give my life to you again today. And ask Lord that you will use me. Ask Lord that you will hold me. Ask Lord that you will carry me. Ask Lord that you will give me peace and give me rest and carry my burdens. I thank you Lord for your body and your blood that was shed and broken for me. You died so that I can know eternal life. It's that simple. Thank you for that, Jesus. Let's just share this together, friends. Bought some new batteries for these microphones and they don't fit. They're the, they're the right batteries, but they don't physically fit in there. So <laughs> let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word is good for teaching, rebuking, training righteousness, so that the man and woman of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Today, Lord, we ask that you speak into our hearts in Jesus' name. Many in that stampede were killed, including many children, and 
for so many injured. And we pray for them today, that you would comfort those that mourn, you will be with those that are suffering, those that are caring for. And that as a nation, not only will they know that they are being thought of and prayed for across the world today, but also, Lord, you will continue to reveal your truth of who your Messiah is for them, that they may come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chosen people of God. They were given their own land through Abraham around 4,000 years ago. And over the years, of course, Israel has been invaded many times. And finally, they were banished from their own land around 2,000 years ago by the Romans. And throughout the last 2,000 years, they have known what it is to be mistrusted, to be feared, and of course to be persecuted. Tragically, even here in the UK, in the Middle Ages. And then of course came the Holocaust, that almost unimaginable attempt at genocide. And then finally, uh, around just over 70 years ago, they were restored to their own land after almost 2,000 years of being banished from their land. But of course, the name of Israel wasn't first given to the nation, it was first given to a man. A man who had 12 sons that became the 12 tribes of Israel. But if you know the story, you'll know that Israel wasn't the name that he was given when he was born. Pastor Mark shared that story with us, opened that story up to us last week from Genesis 25. That amazing story of Isaac's wife, Rebecca, who was pregnant and carrying twins. And how as they grew to maturity in her womb, they began to jostle with each other in her womb. So much so that she was thinking, I can't take this any longer, I can't stand this. And she cried out to God, God, what's going on? What's happening inside my womb? Why are these two uh, babies inside me jostling in this way? And she was given a message from God. God said to her that there are two nations in your womb. And they're struggling, they're wrestling with each other. But God said to her, the oldest will serve the youngest, the older will serve the younger. But when the time came for her delivery, first out of her womb was Esau, that ruddy man, Esau. He came out first, but only just first, because close on his heels, in fact grabbing his heel, came the, the one behind him who was holding Esau's heel as he came out of the womb. So much so that he was given the name Jacob, because that name means twister, deceiver. He was grabbing the heel of his slightly older twin. It's incredible, isn't it, how names can define you? Some people, when they're born, are given the name of a film star or some other celebrity or iconic figure. I guess part of it is just the glamour of being given that name or giving that name to your child. But Part of it perhaps is the hope that they too will have stardust, they will rise to that level of achievement in their lives as well. Great expectation is put on them. Of course the same happens when people are given other names. We think of people who are given family names. The pressure there can be even greater because you've given the name of your uncle or your aunt or a grandparent, some person back in your family history. And again, the expectation on you is quite significant. You're expected to live up to what that name represents. Supremely in the Bible, names have very real significance. People are given names for all kinds of reasons. I love some of the great Bible names. We, we use a number of them for names of our own family members, our own children. But some of them are less widely used. But when we were pastoring the church up in, in Southport in Lancashire, I had as one of my elders a guy who was Nigerian. And he was um, a hospital consultant. Uh, and his name was Hosea. And what a wonderful name to have. He was one of my elders. Great name to have. Of course, not many people are given the name Judas or, or Cain. 
choice of name for your, your son. We tend to prefer Mark, or John, or Joseph, or Ruth, or Sarah. Great Bible names, but ones which perhaps are slightly more sanitized than names like Judas and Cain. But of course, all too often what shapes your life is not so much the birth name you're given, but the names that are put on you by other people, perhaps even sometimes by your own family. Names like failure, waster, useless, perhaps even unwanted, unloved. If you're watching Line of Duty, you'll know a little bit about that. How do you live with the name Twister and Deceiver? You kind of think when Jacob was named that there was a little bit of a sense and it's a bit of a joke as he's born as the second twin. We call him Deceiver because he's grasping the heel of his twin. But Jacob lived up to his name. In fact, he played the part almost too well. I want you to follow with me the story in Genesis chapter 27. If you have your Bible, please feel free to turn to it and join with me as I read this account to you of how Jacob, deceiver, twister, lived up to his name. It's Genesis 27, and here is the account of what happened, how he proved that he was named correctly. Genesis 27, verse 1. When Isaac was old, and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see. He called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man, and don't know the day of my death. Now, then get your weapons, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like, and bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so that I can prepare some tasty food for your father, just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, but my brother is a hairy man and I am a man with smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I will, be a, I will appear to be tricking him and will bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do as I say and go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebecca took the clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house and put them on her younger son Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins. Then she handed to her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. He went to his father and said, My father. Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of the game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so that I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac and touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, but his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau, so he blessed him. Are you really my son Esau? he asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, My son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him and he ate. And he brought some wine and he drank. And then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. 
When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of heaven's dew, of earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac finished, his, finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, sit up and eat some of the game, so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? He has deceived me these two times. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. Then he, then he asked, Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you made all his relative servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Deceiver, twister, Jacob certainly lived up to his name. The threat from his brother Esau was the threat to kill him. Not surprising, is it, after what he had done? And so Jacob fled at his mother's suggestion like a lot of his mother's suggestions, fled to his uncle Laban, his mother's brother. And there he married two, in fact, of the daughters, Leah and then Rachel, and had in total from them and two of the servant girls, 12 sons. And he stayed there and worked as a shepherd. In fact, if you read on that story, there's plenty of deception in that story as well. He didn't stop being Jacob the deceiver. But after 20 years of being with Laban and raising his own family, he left to return home. The time had come. But of course, for Jacob to return home meant facing the brother Esau that he had deceived. He was afraid of his brother, afraid his brother would still want to kill him after he'd taken his birthright and his blessing. But what followed was arguably the key moment in Jacob's 40 years of life to date. That night before he met his fearsome, awesome brother Esau was a crucial night for Jacob. Jacob planned the night well. As the evening came, he sent his family ahead of him and his possessions over the river that they come to, the river Jabbok, and he stayed on the other bank of the river to wrestle with his demons, to face up, if you like, to his deceitful nature, his identity. He decided that he needed to change, to become the kind of man he should be. I like to think of that night that Jacob spent wrestling with himself as much as anything, as being like the dark night of the soul. We all have them. We all have those moments when we have to face up to what we are, what we have become, perhaps how life has shaped us, how we've reacted to life, the kind of people we have become, perhaps not the kind of people we wish we were. And we have those moments where we wrestle with our demons, we deal with that question of, who am I? What am I trying to be? How can I change? How can I be a better person, a different person? Perhaps more tolerant, perhaps more understanding, more thoughtful, more loving. I guess the reality is that for most of us, those dark nights of the soul are things that we are able to keep pretty secret. 
to ourselves. But for Jacob, there was no such luxury. The truth of what happened for his dark night of the soul is told just a few chapters on in Genesis chapter 32. And it's this is the key for what I want us to think of and remember this morning. Genesis 32, verse 22, describes that night. He sent all his family ahead of him. He's now alone. It's late at night. And he starts to wrestle, not just with himself, but more specifically with God as well. Listen to this. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what's your name? Jacob, he replied. He could have just as easily have said, deceiver, twister. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Jacob's name changed at last after more than 40 years of life. No longer Jacob, the deceiver, but Israel. What does the name Israel mean? The name Israel means he struggles with God. It's amazing, isn't it, how that name not only defined Jacob, now Israel, but that name has defined the entire nation for thousands of years. To this day, Israel struggles with God. They rejected their Messiah, Jesus, and today they still struggle with God. The truth is, of course, we all struggle with God sometimes, don't we? We all have our moments where we wrestle with our faith, where we ask questions about who we are, what we are, what God is doing in our lives, what it all means. I think it's vital that we do struggle with God, that we wrestle with the things, that we grapple with, with the things that shape us, that make us who we are. It's not a bad thing to grapple with God, to face up to those things. I had the privilege of being born in a Christian family. My parents were missionaries, and I was born in Mumbai as it is today, Bombay, where my, mission, where my parents were missionaries in India at that time. And as a young man, because I'd been raised in a Christian home, it became the most natural thing for me as a child. I think the first time I remember making a specific decision to accept Jesus into my life, I was eight years old. And then, I guess, as I grew up and went through my teenage years, I wrestled, I struggled with God, I wrestled with Him. I had times when I walked away, and I had to have my teenage conversion. And then maybe, in a sense, later on, in the as I became an adult, I had to wrestle still again to define who I was. It's a, a journey you have if you're brought up in a Christian home. It's an important journey. It's an important struggle and question the things that we have to go through. We have to determine by God's grace to be the person God wants us to be. And of course, we also struggle with the things we face in life why God allows some things to happen. Why God doesn't answer every prayer in the way we want him to. And we feel sometimes as though the heavens are like grass. God isn't listening to what we're saying to him. We struggle with why perhaps we lose someone we love. We struggle when we face hard times and difficulties. We struggle with God. 
And we need to. It's important that we do. It's amazing, isn't it, how Jacob the deceiver becomes Israel. The father, not just of 12 sons, but of a whole nation. God's chosen people. Kings like David and Solomon. Prophets like Elijah or Isaiah. But of course, supremely, Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, God's son, our saviour. I will change your name. God changed the deceiver into he struggles with God, into Israel. And God can change any name. He's changed my name. He'll change your name. Simon becomes Peter. Saul becomes Paul. I guess the message in all of this for me is this. You don't have to be who people say you are. If you allow God to change your name, then you are who God says you are, not who other people say you are. You are a child of God. You are a son or daughter of the King of Kings. You become his voice in the desert of our once Christian country. You become his witness in the courtroom of public opinion. You become his presence in your community, your family circle. You become who he says you are. You take the name he gives you. And it's a glorious thing to know that you are a child of the King. One songwriter put it like this a few years back now. I will change your name. You shall no longer be called wounded, outcast, lonely, or afraid. I will change your name. Your new name will be confidence, joyfulness, overcoming one, faithfulness, friend of God, one who seeks my face. Amen. The challenge today from this passage we've been looking at, this story of Jacob the deceiver who becomes the one who struggles with God, the ancestor of the great nation which is God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. The challenge today is don't be defined in your life by who people say you are. Be defined by the name God has given you. Father, thank you today that you have given us the name which is, I am a child of God, I am a son of God, I am a daughter of the living God. Lord, you call us in our lives to reckon with who we are, to struggle with you, to wrestle with those things that shape us and make us. Lord, help us as we come through those struggles to come out knowing who we are, that we are a child of God and we are defined by who you say we are. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes. Let's stand together. That is an incredibly powerful message. It really is an incredibly powerful word. I don't need to go over that, reiterate that, but just know today that you are not who the world says you are. You have the ability to be who God says you are, to take on his identity. Let's worship.
Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace, which changes lives. We thank you, Lord, that our identity is not in who people say we are. It's not in who the world says we are. It's not even in who we think we might be, but it is in you. It is in you. It is in who you say we are. Thank you, God, that you can change our names in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. That means smile on you. The Lord smile on you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. Amen. Amen. Do I say that so often? And I had somebody come to me last week and say, what does countenance mean? So I thought maybe I should just explain that in case there were others. Bless you. Uh, do help yourselves to a cake on the way out. Thank you so much for that, Malcolm. Bless you. And uh, through here, through these doors, there's an offering basket here. If you want to put something in that, please do. We recognize that most people are giving uh, electronically at the moment, and that's fine. God bless you.